Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to this time of worship. We're continuing with our stewardship emphasis on a God-lived life. Tonight, a life lived for others. Let's join in our opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you revealed your Father's gracious heart to us by the life you lived for us and by the death you died for us. Grant that your gifts of encouragement, comfort, tenderness, and compassion will make us like you, O Christ, to our neighbor, so that they may always know your heart and rejoice that you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
first lesson will also be the basis for our sermon tonight from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. epistle reading is taken from James chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, 
Who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of the Lord. rise for the reading of the gospel. We hear the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. They wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Grace to you and peace from the God who is our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We consider this evening the words of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, and recognize that a God-lived life is a life lived for others. What do you want to be? Parents ask that often of young children. Young children may ask the question of them themselves. The question that comes back when you graduate from grade school and again from, from high school. And the answers very often, early on at least, are to be an architect or a baker or a, a chef or a dentist, to be a professional football or basketball player, um, or somebody with a very high profile and perhaps high paying job. What does God want you to be? He wants you to be like Christ. Now that's clear in our lesson from Philippians chapter 2. But it's also clear really from the first verses of, that, of the first chapter and also beyond our, our lesson, the kind of life to which we have been called. There is really no calling that can be any more demanding. Being a Christian is not a, a one hour plus job a week. It's not a part-time-ish 20 hours or 40 or 60 or 80 hours. That it is a call to live our entire life for Christ and to be like Christ in what we think and say and do. But is this for me? That question might come into our minds when we hear those statements that begin our lesson. The beginning of that lesson seems to be intended to compel us to look inside ourselves, to confront us with what we are or what we failed to do. Look inside. How much do you find in terms of encouragement? Comfort, tenderness, compassion. How much eagerness to share Christ with people who do not yet know him. So four times we see the statement, if. And then after those four conditional statements, we finally find then. Sounds like four conditions that then lead into an even bigger challenge. Saying, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. The Greek language has ways of saying things with far fewer words than we would need in English or to make, make a translation sound good in English. In that first verse of Philippians chapter 2, there are no verbs. The word you does not appear there in any way. Here's how it starts out. you have any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and, and compassion. Do you have those things? Do I have those things? The Evangelical Heritage Version handles the challenges of that verse in a, in a much better, clearer way. Because literally what we have here is if then any encouragement 
in Christ. So they translate, if, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, they answer the question very clearly. There is. There is encouragement that comes from Christ. There is comfort that flows from his love. There is a fellowship established by his gift of the Spirit. And there is affection and compassion to be found in him. And that then enables us to move on to the encouragement of verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit, and having one mind. Now Paul calls for those same things that we receive from Christ to be seen in us as we relate to others. This reminded me of how it came about that the communist government of Vietnam asked our church, our synod, to establish a training center for pastors, training pastors to serve in the minority church, uh, the Hmong church within their country. That came about because the government recognized that there was a real drop-off in, in strife and contentiousness and so on from a whole bunch of different isolated Hmong churches, Hmong Christian churches. And the reason for that came to be found in that they had looked to find some training. And they found a website from a Wells pastor who served the Hmong community. And so the government recognized the kind of unity, the kind of fellowship that was established by that distinctly Lutheran approach. Notice from that verse 2, verse 2 onward, Paul is encouraging us to be like Christ. And again, what he's talking about is a change from the inside out because it's a change of attitude, it's a change of priorities. And so he writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit. But in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we consider those attitudes of ambition, and pride, and acting out of self-interest. There is a Christian author who refers to these things as sins of self-protection. Because that's the nature of these sins, they often fly under the radar, people not recognizing the guilt of what they are doing in watching out for themselves first and recognizing that only their interests and their needs. Understand that to be like Christ in this world is something that can be very scary for us. Ambition, pride, looking out for our own needs, that kind of comfortable territory. They seem to be right. Not something we recognize as wrong in ourselves, although we certainly recognize when selfish behavior by somebody else is not the right thing to do. We'll complain about it. When it comes to selfish goals and selfish priorities, we always seem to have the energy to pursue them. But here is the most demanding statement made by Paul. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. That's scary because 
we know where that attitude and his priorities led him. They led him to mockery and torture, to suffering, shame, and to death on a cross. That's where his attitude and his priorities led him. And he did not come into this world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To think like Christ, to be like him from the inside out, could any higher standard be set before us as the standard we are to pursue and aspire to? Now, some people would see in that only a relentless pressure to try to be or pretend to be something that they know they are not. A challenge to think about other people in the way Christ thinks about other people. And we will find that it's impossible for us if we forget what comes first. One can only be like Christ if one is blessed to know what Christ is like. To do the things he did only possible in the confidence of knowing what he did for us and for our salvation as our substitute and our Savior. You can't imitate somebody you don't know. And yet Paul says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, that is, to be used his, for his own advantage but that he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We are set free from a frightened, pressure-filled pursuit of our own needs, by meeting the Christ who is absolutely committed to meeting all of our needs for time and for eternity. And then he raises our sights as to what we are meant to be, what we were in fact created to be, by calling us to live our lives for others, by calling us to live for the one who died for us and was raised again. So, who exactly are these others whom we are to serve? Is it a mystery like that young man did, asking, well, who exactly is my neighbor? Well, but have you take the time to consider those characteristics of Christ's love that Paul begins with in verse 1? The kind of love that comes from Christ is characterized by encouragement, comfort, tenderness, and compassion. So his love is meant for those who are frightened, who are troubled, who are being treated roughly, harshly by other people. That comfort is meant for people who, who suffer. Now that kind of needs brings out the priest and Levite within us. That is, that when we see such needs, we want to kind of pretend that we haven't seen them. But in the very act of passing by on the other side, we, we make it evident that we've seen their need because we're trying not to be confronted by it. But we're called to something higher. The one thing that makes Christ's love so precious to us is that he sees us. He sees us. He sees our needs. He sees our wounds, the wounds we inflict on ourselves, the wounds that have been inflicted by, by others. He sees our need for, for comfort. He sees our needs and he looks upon us with compassion. 
In Christ, we have the one who sees our needs, who sees us. And the Christ who sees those needs in us acts to meet those needs. But that same Christ who sees those needs in us also sees the needs of others through us. And he would have us show his compassion and love to others. His heart's desire is to meet those needs of others through us and through our introducing Christ to those who do not yet know him so that they know his heart, his grace, his compassion, his promises. That life to which we are called is incredibly challenging and demanding. So what are we to do? Well, find the strength to meet those challenges in the strength and commitment of Christ's love for you. And then share that strength by sharing the good news of him, by sharing his promises and doing what you can to meet the needs of others. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. It's nice to see your smiling faces. When we had the earlier service, everyone had masks on. I couldn't tell if they were smiling or frowning, so it's nice to see you. Um, obviously, you've seen a great video and heard Pastor Faustian talk about living a life of service to others. Uh, last month, we had our focus on living the life of a disciple of Jesus and a challenge or two that we could challenge ourselves with. If you could, you should have a yellow insert in your bulletin. If you could pull that out. If you don't have one, I have some extras. Anybody need one? All good? If we look at the front with the introduction and the um, beginning, which was Philippians 2, verse 1, um, that was our sermon. And uh, I would skip down to just a little bit underneath where it had Philippians 2, verse 1. Um, if you could, maybe grab a pencil or a pen. Got a little spot underneath there where you could jot down some ways Jesus offers you comfort and encouragement. If you got a second and you want to think about it, I'll give you a second to maybe make a few notes. Well, you probably have some good ideas in there. Here's a couple. We are forgiven. We are loved. He has adopted us into his family. He has a wonderful plan for our life. And we get to join Jesus in heaven one day. Um, just below that, what is one great way to thank Jesus for all that he's done for us? Well, we could pay it forward. Imitate Christ by reflecting his love to other people. And we can pray the dangerous prayer, Lord, use me. Now what does it mean to have a dangerous prayer? It's not praying on the edge of a cliff or anything like that. But it means if you ask Jesus and our Lord to put opportunities in your path to help and serve others, watch out. When you pray that prayer, there's a good chance he's going to put some opportunities and some people in front of you that you can possibly have an encounter with. And you can reflect his love to them, just like the Good Samaritan did when he met the man on the road who had been robbed. There's two passages that are on here that when I was preparing with Pastor Hine, he had brought up, and I thought they had to be on here because the first one I thought was really interesting. It's, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the second one, Colossians 4 or 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, 
make the most of every opportunity. So what does it mean to be present in the lives of others? Obviously, intentionally look for ways to listen, to care, and to serve. Pastor had another comment that he made that I thought was great. If our eyes are open and our hearts are in the right place, opportunities are going to come to us. And don't keep your light hidden under a bushel. Let it shine. If you use the analogy, or if I could, of a sports team, if you think about being on a basketball team or a baseball team, if you're on the team, you don't want to be on the bench. You want to be in the game. You want to participate. You want to contribute. This is what Jesus is asking us to do in a service of life to others. So if you remember from last month with living a life of a disciple, we had a challenge. We challenged ourselves. So if you turn over the other side, there's a challenge card. And on that challenge card, you can see at the top, those are some of the points that were made in the video. But what steps will I take to present and live a life for others? There's some ideas in here for each of us to choose as a personal challenge to adopt and commit to. If we choose something from here and we sign it and we take it home, and just like last month when we asked you to put it on your refrigerator, that challenge of being a disciple of Christ, the same thing this time, if you could, put it right next to it or put it on your desk if you put the last one on your desk. If you missed the last one, this will be a new challenge for you. One of the things from the video last month was how do you stay focused on it? It's to a, one key thing was eliminating distractions or interruptions so that you can focus in on this challenge. So living a life for others and being present, this is our challenge. I'll share one last thing. I got an email this morning. It was kind of one of those things that I thought, you know, this is how God works. I, it was weird because the topic or the subject on the email was words of wisdom. I don't, I don't know who sent it to me, but I saw that and I thought, well, I could use some words of wisdom. So obviously I opened it up. I thought maybe my wife sent it to me. She's usually giving me some words of wisdom. But here it is. And I thought it was really awesome. A moment of self-compassion can change your whole day. A string of such moments can change the course of your life. So if it can change your life, how can you change someone else's and help them by serving them? So thank you. Thank you for being present. And good luck on your challenge. Thank you. Let us now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's now join our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, by the life you live for us as our substitute and Savior, you call us to live for others. By the power of that good news you create in us to desire to be like you, we find all that we need in knowing what you are like and in knowing the strength of your love. Your love has the power to encourage, to comfort, to connect us with one another. There is tenderness and compassion in your love for us. Lead us to recognize where sins of self-protection are keeping us from showing your love to others. Lord Jesus, you see us in all our needs. Make us like you, so that we do not pass by others in need, pretending that we do not see them. Everything that is precious about your love for us, that love which is encourages, comforts, cares, and shows compassion, equips us to be like you for those who need to know your love for them. Open our eyes to see the wonder of your love for us. Give us strength to convey that love to others. Lord, this weekend, we entrust to your care our veterans. We thank you for the service they've offered to our country in defense of our freedoms. Lord, we pray that you would bless them as they continue to serve you in their daily lives. Lord, we rejoice in the wondrous blessings you give to us in marriage. We ask you to pour out your rich blessings upon Corey Johnson and Amy Boswick, who will be married on Friday. Help them to enjoy many years of joy and happiness together as they reflect that love that you lavish upon them in their dealings with one another. Lord, we entrust to your care all who are sick or hurting or hospitalized. Be with Deb Harvis, relative of Kurt and Chris, dealing with a serious infection. Also with Jane Barnes, who is receiving hospice care, and Don Schultz, the husband of Mary, who is undergoing rehab at Cedar Community. Be with them in their time of need. Bless their medical care and treatment and rehab, and grant them your strength and your healing power. And Lord, watch over Lauren Schultz, who is in failing health. As he, ends the, as he approaches the end of his earthly journey, help him to find joy in the knowledge that he belongs to you and that paradise awaits him in heaven. We ask all this, Jesus, in your saving name, and join in the prayer which you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. 
For Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.